Okay, good afternoon. My name is Timothy Ang. Okay, so this is the topic I'm going to talk about today, how to pick stocks for your portfolio. Just a short disclaimer, okay, everything I say today is for educational purposes only, okay? Okay, a little bit about myself. I think uh, the guy introduced me well enough. So, I actually graduated from the uh, University of Western Australia. Okay, so I have a double major in finance and accounting. And also, I frequently write articles for the company and also uh, do quite a few of the, this kind of external engagements. Okay, this, so this is the agenda that we're going through today. Okay, how to pick industries, how to pick stocks, uh, some portfolio examples, and also some portfolio allocation. Okay, so first, picking industries. So there's so many industries to pick from right in Singapore. So where do we start? What do we need to know? Okay, first thing that you might want to need to know is whether the industry is cyclical or non-cyclical. So, uh, an example of a cyclical company might be your property sector. Okay, so the reason why it's cyclical is because it follows the economy. So, if the economy does well, usually the property sector also does well, and that's because we see that people are earning more money, they have more money to spend, and then they'll buy more property. Okay, an example of a non-cyclical sector can be your utilities, okay, your telcos. Okay, the reason why it's non-cyclical is because regardless of the economy, okay, people will still need to use their telecommunication services and these kind of things. So what's attractive about it is that it doesn't follow the economy okay, and it's more stable. So the reason why we need to know whether it's cyclical or not is it, sometimes it might affect your portfolio stability. Okay, so the second thing that is more important okay, is we want to know the risks and the prospects of the industry that we're investing in. Okay, so let's look at the chart below, okay, and an example. So we can see that the energy sector actually um, outperformed in, uh, in the US as of 2016, okay, outperformed in comparison to the healthcare sector. Okay, so why is this so? It's because there's several factors. Okay, for the healthcare sector, there was quite a lot of risk in 2016. So when we saw Donald Trump actually took up the presidency in 2016, okay, um, he actually mentioned that he wanted to repeal Obamacare. Okay? He also mentioned that he wanted to put pressure on drug prices. So as investors, you need to know this kind of risk when we want to invest in certain industries. Okay? So for the oil and gas sector, so why did it outperform? It's because we saw some prospects. Okay? We saw that the oil price was so low, it actually bottomed out at about $28. Okay, so because it came down from such a low point and because the industry was so beaten down, there was actually more upside to it in comparison to the other industries. And also, another prospect was that we saw OPEC actually cutting their oil production. Okay, so that was another prospect. Okay, so uh, generally you want to know the risks and the prospects of the industry. Okay, so something closer to home, okay, I'll be explaining some of the industries that are important to the Singapore market and also to yourselves because I know most of you actually invest in most of these industries, okay. So first of all, we'll talk about the telecommunication industry. Okay, this industry is generally non-cyclical and that's because regardless of the, the economy, people still need to use their telco and mobile services, okay. So um, the next thing about this industry is that generally it's very attractive because it pays attractive dividends. So we see Singtel paying 4.62% and then we see Starhub paying 6.92%. And so that's why a lot of investors find this industry quite attractive. But the question that we need to ask, that we all need to ask ourselves is this, okay? Is the dividend sustainable? Okay, so how many of you think that the dividends will be sustainable in the, for the telco industry? Okay, how many of you all think it won't be sustainable? Okay, generally good. Huh? So in my opinion, okay, go way forward, I think the telco dividends uh, might be challenged. Okay, the first reason is that we can see that historically the pay TV trend has been on a decline. And why is this? Because we see that there's a lot more substitutes like YouTube, we got free online video streaming, we got Netflix, okay, and then we can see that a lot of young people, okay, they're not watching TV anymore, <laughs> okay, they're going to YouTube to watch their videos and this kind of things, okay. Secondly, we, this is the more major thing, we see that there's a lot of new entrants into the industry, so TPG launching their new service next year, 
Okay, Circles Live is already in. They're already offering very cheap mobile data. So we can see a shift of uh, market share to them. Okay. So then lastly, we got My Republic. Okay. Probably at the end of this year, they're going to launch uh, their new services. So the question is whether the dividends can be sustainable, and that's and to some extent, it, it, it might not be. So we already can see that some of the telco industries are cutting their dividends. So Starhub and M1 has been really cutting their dividends already. So moving forward for this industry, I think something that you might want to watch out for is the capital expenditures of these companies. And like I said, because there's a lot of co competitors coming in, okay, the cost will increase when we're talking about the spectrum bidding costs. So these mobile uh, companies have to bid for their spectrum, and if the costs go up, right, then these companies need to find ways to finance, find the funds to pay off these costs. And let's say if they have really have a lot of debt, right, then they might have some issues. So this is something that we want, may, uh, might want to actually have a look uh, for this industry. Okay, banking sector, another big industry for Singapore. Okay, we can see that the Singapore economy has actually done quite well this year. So we see that it's actually growing higher than expected, okay, higher confi uh, consumer confidence. And this generally was beneficial for the banks. You can see that some of the banks already increased by over 20 to 30 percent this year already. Okay, and the reason is because this industry is cyclical. So it does well when the economy is doing well. Okay, another major thing, major thing that the, this industry benefited from is a major trend that has been happening in the world. Okay, so we see that the Federal Reserve has been increasing interest rates gradually, and this has led to the increase in the cyborg rate. So why the increase in the cyborg rate matters is because uh, when the banks issue your residential loans, right, they use this interest rate to charge their clients and to people like you, okay, when you buy property, they'll charge you this interest. So when we see an uptick in the cyborg rate, generally banks will do better with regards to their interest income and also their net interest margins. Okay, so yeah, that's one of the trends that's happening in this industry at the moment. But that being said, we need to be wary of the risks of this industry. Okay, so we need to be aware that the banks actually lend money to companies that may be facing some issues at the moment. So some companies that you may recognize here, easy on Nam Chiong, okay? So when we see that the oil price has been depressed and suppressed so low because of oversupply, okay, some companies might actually face troubles paying off their loans. Okay, so when, when that happens, right, they need to find ways in order to repay their loans, okay, repay their interest expenses, and that's, that's why, and if we see the oil price being suppressed so long, right, uh, they might actually continue to face troubles in the future, in the near future, and then the banks might be negatively affected. So this is one of the risks for the banking industry. Okay, so last industry. Oh, sorry. This is the oil price. Okay, so break-even price for most companies is at around $60. So currently now it's trading below that level. So because of that, we might see challenges for the oil companies. Okay, last industry, REITs. Okay. How many of you all think that REITs are cyclical? Okay, how many of you all think it's non-cyclical? Okay, the, the answer is actually probably neither. And it's because it depends on the industry of REIT that you actually invest in. So in Singapore, there's many types of REITs, okay? So we can see there's industrial retail diversified. So if you're talking about cyclical REITs, okay, a good example would be hotels. Okay, when the economy is good, people earn more money, they tend to spend more, and then they tend to travel more, and then they tend to stay in Singapore more. Okay, so when we see tourism uh, rise in Singapore, okay, that usually equates to more people you know, staying in hotels, and then the REITs do better. Lah. But if we're talking about healthcare REITs, okay, this one is probably non-cyclical, and it's because regardless of the economy, people still need to use hospitals. So that's why it's quite important to know whether the industry is cyclical or not. So it affects, because it affects your portfolio stability. Okay. Something attractive about REITs is that it pays very attractive dividend yield. So by, by law, it's mandated to pay out 90% of its income, okay? And it will also have tax benefits because when you look at your IRS statement, you're not taxed on the dividends that you receive from REITs. Okay, so average dividend yield for REITs now is about 6.5%, and that's much higher than the inflation rate. And it's also much higher than your 
Singapore government bond yields, which is about 2.2% on average. So this is actually a good hedge against inflation okay, for REITs. And generally, if you pick your REITs well, it will be stable. It will, it will give you stable returns. Okay, so this is why a lot of people are attracted to REITs. Okay, question. Who thinks rising interest rates are bad for REITs? Okay, who thinks it's good? Okay, it's not so clear cut. Okay, so there's two answers to this. Okay, the first answer is that okay, when the interest rates rise, we see that there's higher interest expenses. And then that leads to lower income, and then le that leads to lower dividends. So we might see share price go down. But on the flip side, right, when we see higher interest rates, it means that the economy is picking up. Okay, so that means that more property demand, okay, then more income and revenue for the REITs. So uh, the REITs perform better. Okay? So generally, we want to look back at the chart. Okay? We can see that since the Fed started raising interest rates in December 2016, we can see that actually REITs outperformed the STI index, the blue line over the yellow line. So that's why we can see that the Nikko AM ETF just now actually, the REIT ETF actually did so well. Okay? So this is a space that we might probably want to look at for REITs. Uh, in the coming quarters, when the Fed Reserve actually meet again, and they might want to raise their rates again. Okay, so diversification is a very important concept. Okay, so some people don't practice it. Okay, but for us retail investors, I think it's necessary, and that's because we need to be aware of the risk, and we need to protect our capital. So one way we can do it is by investing in different industries in our portfolio. So we don't limit our risk to just one industry. So we, we invest into multiple industries so that we can limit our risk okay, into just one specific industry. Okay, next thing, picking stocks. Okay, so today I'll be talking to you about fundamental analysis, uh, something that I like to use. Okay, so what do we look for when we're trying to determine what companies to invest in? Okay, four things I usually look at. Okay, the debt first, the earnings, business model, then valuation. Okay, first thing, debt. Okay, some current some ratios that I look at. Okay, current ratio, which is the current assets over current liabilities, and then debt to equity ratio. Okay. So why is debt such a big issue? Okay, so actually when during the Great Financial Depression uh, depression, we can see that uh, when companies take on too much debt, okay, their risk of going bankrupt increases. Okay, and when a company goes bankrupt, you as an investor get back nothing. Okay, so that's why one of the first things that I look at in the company is the debt levels. Okay, so when we see that all these oil companies start having struggling paying off their debts, you know, you see Nam Chung, you say Easy On, and then some of them, some of investors actually buy their bonds and then now they're stuck inside. It's because uh, these companies actually took on too much debt that they can service at this point in time. Okay, so actually they might be able to service their debt. Okay, but when we see the oil price is so low, okay, uh, they are actually try they are actually currently now facing some troubles. Okay, so so one thing I look at very important is the debt level. Secondly, profits. Okay, some ratios I look at return on equity. Okay, which is the net income over shareholders' equity net income margin, net income over sales, and then revenue and income track record. So, first example is sets, okay? So how many people own sets? Okay, not <laughs> I've so little people. <laughs> okay, so those shareholders, right? Okay, uh, they may, they'll probably be quite happy because over the past few years, you can see that sets price has been performing quite well. And the reason is because we can see that their net interest margin has been increasing year on year, and their net income has been increasing year on year. And the reason why is that the management has been very good at improving their productivity of their staff, of their services. Okay? So that's one good thing that I look for in companies, is increasing margins. Okay, who owns SPH? Okay, no need to raise up your hand, no need to raise up your hand. <laughs> so SPH shareholders might probably be facing some difficulties at the moment. Okay, and the reason is because when we see that media income has been declining over the past four years, okay, people have been advertising lesser and lesser on newspapers, 
and more and more going digital, okay? So we can see that the SPH earnings has been hit over the past few years. And when I see a company's revenues and income been decreasing year on year, that's a signal that something about the company is of some concern, okay? So that's something that I look at. Okay, next. Business model, okay, this is something that is quite important to me. So there's something called a competitive moat. Okay, a moat is something that you use to protect your castle, okay? So the bigger the moat, the bigger the protection. So generally, when a company has a strong business model, we can see that the company has a bigger moat. So you can protect its business in the future, you can protect its profits, you can protect its earnings. So some things that a big moat comprises of, okay, a good brand, okay? Economies of scale, a good value chain, a uh, very, a lot of intellectual property that is highly demanded by a lot of people, like your iPhone, okay? iPhone, the brand, the technology is worth a lot to Apple. Okay, government regulations. So some examples in Singapore, uh, who use Tiger Balm? Okay, eh? not many people. <laughs> Actually, Tiger Balm is quite a famous brand in Singapore, okay? It's a very good muscle rub. When your muscle is sore, you just rub it and, wow, very effective. <laughs> so, uh, how the company positioned this brand is that it, it actually it, it makes it a very historical brand in Singapore. Okay, it built a lot of loyal customers. Okay, and that's how a, and and that's why a lot of people. Okay, maybe not a lot of people here, but in Singapore, they like to buy and consistently buy Tiger Balm. Okay, and that's how a brand helps a company to be resilient and to grow. And it's because a lot of people are aware of the brand. So secondly, SGX. Who owns SGX? Okay, more people. Okay, so SGX, it has government regulations that permit only one exchange to be in Singapore. So why is it so popular with investors at the start? It's because we see that uh, there was a barrier to entry due to government regulations in Singapore in the past, and it was a monopoly. Okay, so that's why it was popular among a lot of investors in the past. But one thing we need to be aware of is that government regulations might not, oh, it might change in the future. Okay, so but for SGX, uh, I don't think that's of your concern as of now. Okay, some negative examples for the business mode. Okay, might be ComfortDelGro and SingPost. So when a company, you know, we can see that the earnings have been falling. Okay, recently. So when a company doesn't have a big business mode. Okay. So we see that competitors are coming forth. So for Comfort, Delcro, we can see Uber and Grab. Okay, it's very easy to steal their business because they do not have a big competitive mode. Then for SingPost, we can see that you know there's a lot of a lot of people are going to e-statements nowadays. You know, it's a substitute to to the snail mail. And we can see a lot of ninja vans and these kind of things. You know, small local SMEs stealing the business from SingPost. It doesn't have a big competitive mode against these kind of players. So we can see their profits being hit. So when a company chooses not to innovate and they choose not to strengthen their business model uh, going forward, right? And then we, that's where we can see the earnings being hit into the future. Okay, so when we choose a company, we choose it for its very strong business model. Okay, and lastly, valuation. Okay, some ratios I look at is the PE and the PB ratio. So I don't want to bore you with the equations. I'll give you an example. So can anybody tell me the, the similarities between these two companies? Supermarket, right? Yeah. They both do supermarket business. Okay, so Dairy Farm do your cold storage, and Dairy Farm does your giant, and Seng Chong just does Seng Chong supermarkets. Okay, so similar business model. So when we do valuation, one of the easiest way to do it is by relative valuation. And that's when we compare the PE and PP ratio between similar companies. So as of now, this period, we can see that Seng Chong's PE ratio is slightly lower than Dairy Farm, and also we can see that the PB ratio is slightly lower than Dairy Farm also. Okay, but we need to be aware that there may be reasons for this. Okay, so some reasons might be because Dairy Farm is a larger cap stock, okay? It has more businesses under its wing, okay? And it has other businesses besides supermarket, whereas Seng Chong is just a supermarket. Okay, so, and also with regards, with regards to growth, okay, Seng Chong is currently only in Singapore, I believe, or they're expanding to China a bit. So expansions, the prospects might be lower than dairy farm. And so that's why whenever you see a cheap company, doesn't mean a buy, okay? You need to find out the reason why it's cheap. 
So it's not so straightforward in that sense. Okay, so after, after talking so much about fundamental analysis, okay, I just want to talk to you about a stock that I found back in mid-2016. Okay, this is a stock that I actually invested in myself and I actually recommended to some clients. Okay, the company you all might not know about it is quite a small company. It's called Sunningdale Tech. What they do is that they manufacture precision plastics such as your laptop casing or your car dashboard, these kind of things. So fundamentals-wise, I like this company because you look, the revenues and the net income has been consistently rising year on year. So managing expenses well, generating more income. Okay, that's, those are the things that I'm looking for in a good company. Then with the debt, the debt ratios, okay, valuation, business model, everything I like also. So lo and behold, we look at the share price. Okay, I bought it around here. Okay. And currently now it's around two dollars. What it around one dollar? So I had, so the returns has been quite good recently, about eighty percent. And that's how you can use fundamental analysis. You know, you need to have criteria that you have to hit for your company so that you, it, it helps you to make safer investments and make a uh, higher chance to make higher returns. So that's how you use fundamental analysis to find investments to buy. Okay, ETS. Why am I talking about it? Okay, just now you already heard a talk about it. Okay, I'm sure you all know, okay, ETFs actually track an index, okay, they track different asset classes. So you can invest in oil, you can invest in property sector, fixed income, you got uh, even Forex, there's Forex ETFs also. Okay, so um, then it, it tracks, a, tracks an index, okay. So the attractive thing about ETFs is that when you buy an ETF, you already get diversification straight away. So example, STI ETF, you buy STI ETF, you have the 30 stocks diversification already. If you buy the S&P 500 ETF, you have diversification into 500 companies already. So that's why it's so attractive to a lot of people. And that's why I'm talking about it today because it's a very attractive thing for passive investors. And I know that the guy, uh, it was spoken to about it before already, so I won't really talk too much about it now. Okay, portfolio examples. I'll share some portfolio examples of some of the portfolios uh, probably of my clients or uh, that I constructed myself. Okay, so the first one, we look at the passive income portfolio. The pa so the passive income portfolio, oh, sorry, not passive, just the income portfolio, okay? So the purpose for the income portfolio is to generate passive income. Okay, so that's why we choose high dividend stocks that have been paying consistently year on year. And that's why we see that we wait the portfolio into 35% into REITs. Okay, so because REITs are historically high dividend yield payers and they've been consistently paying dividends year on year. So that's why we wait 35% into the portfolio, a higher weightage. Okay, then we also see we've diversified into different, a lot of multiple industries and that's to limit our risk into one specific industry. So we can see bank, industrial, energy, property, consumer staple. So when we look at this portfolio and we see the returns, okay, so 48.9% in about three years, okay. So compare it to the STI in ETF, okay, we can see that the returns is much better. But if we compare it to the S&P 500 ETF, we can see that it's about the same, okay, 41.92 compared to 48.79. But we need to be aware that the S&P 500 ETF, you have to pay tax on your dividends, 30% tax, and that's why uh, it might be more attractive for you to invest in Singapore if you're talking about passive income wise. Okay, next portfolio. The passive income portfolio. Just now was the active one, this is the passive one. And the passive one is more focused on ETFs. Okay, the reason why is that because ETFs itself is already diversified and you do not have to worry about the risk of a specific stock because it contains so many stocks already inside. So if a stock goes bankrupt inside, it doesn't really affect that much of the ETF, of the whole index, okay? So passive, you don't, want, you don't want to be active, you don't want to adjust it so much, you don't want to look at it so much, and that's why we only pick a few of it, only three only. Okay, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but we can see that 50% of the weightage is into the Philip Reed ETF, one of the first Reed ETFs in Singapore. Okay, and the reason why is that because it pays very attractive dividend yields. Okay, so about 4.2% currently. 
It used to be 5%, but now it's 4.2. <laughs> okay, so that's the rationale of how you construct your portfolio. You have, you have to adjust it to your own investor objectives. Okay, if you want passive income, you weight more into the pass the income stocks. Okay, last thing, portfolio allocation. Okay, so some clients ask me, oh, Tim, when do I start dumping all my money into the market, okay? When can I invest fully into the market? So one way on how I like to do it is that I look at the market valuation. So just a chart that I've, I've, I've found, okay? So historically, when you look at the STI, ETA, uh, STI index, the market valuation, we can see that every time the price to book value comes near to one, okay, this level is one, okay? You can see that the, the, the index actually rebounds. Okay, so uh, when, we, when we look at the market valuation, it's, okay, we can see historical, but it may not be true in the future, but the, probably, the probability is there that you'll rebound, okay? So the rationale is that it's more safer, and then you probably can allocate more when the, re when the valuation is down because there's a higher probability of a rebound rather than if you invest high, like let's say at the price to book ratio of two, okay, that's a bit high and uh, it's more risky. La. Okay, so an example. Currently now we can see that, uh, okay, example. Uh, so let's say the price to book ratio is around one, okay, for the index. So you can allocate about 90% into equities and 10% into cash. Okay, as in compared to, let's say if the price to book ratio is around 1.4, Okay, then you can allocate about 50% into equities and 50% into cash. So that's one way in which you can allocate your portfolio. Okay, and the rationale why we want to have some cash, right, is two reasons. Okay, the first reason is that we do not want you to invest everything until you have no, no more emergency funds and this kind of things, okay? And then the second reason is because you, want, you might want to be able to catch any undervalued stocks that come up on your watch list. Okay, so that's the second reason you want to, you don't want to miss any good opportunities. Okay, so Philip share bridges plan. Okay, why am I sharing about this? Is because uh, if you are a passive investor that doesn't pay attention much to the market and then you do not see the price to book ratio of the market every day. <laughs> okay, so this is one attractive product that you might want to use, and it's called the Philip share bridges plan. And just like the speaker before. He said that it's a dollar cost averaging. Okay, so the attractive thing about do dollar cost averaging is that, okay, first it's automatic. So it automatically invests for you every month. Okay, and the second thing is that it's, it reduces your risk. And that's because it reduces your risk of buying high at the top, right, and then selling at the bottom. So because you're spreading out and then it averages out your price. Okay, so this is why it's so interesting. And it's a very popular product to a lot of our passive investors. Okay, so if you're, let's say if you're interested, you can meet us outside and then we can talk about it and probably open a share bridges plan for you. Okay, so see, these are some of the stocks that are offered for the Philip share bridges plan. Okay, we can see, in fact, the STI ETF is inside, STI ETF. So if you want to, to use a share bridges plan for it, it's, it's good. Okay, so in summary, Understand the companies and understand the industries that you invest in, okay? Know the industry, the risks and the prospects and whether they're cyclical or not, whether they will affect your stability of your portfolio. Second, diversify. Do not put all your eggs into one basket, okay? So diversify into different industries so that you're not putting all your risks into, let's say, the oil industry. So if the oil industry does badly, okay, you just kill your whole portfolio. Okay, so and lastly, have a strategy. Allocate your portfolio wisely, okay, and be a st good steward of wealth. Okay, lastly, before I end, okay, any of you that do not have an account, you can visit any of our branches, okay, uh, or you can visit us outside later on. So we have 11 branches in Singapore. Okay, and the unique thing about Philips Securities uh, in compared to the competitors is because um, if you walk into a branch, Every branch has an equity dealer inside, okay, which will be able to answer any questions with regards to stocks or corporate actions or this kind of thing. So this is the personal touch that we value and we think that is beneficial to our clients. Okay, so that's why we are one of the biggest in Singapore and, and we are one of the best in regards to stock brokerage. 
And this is my team. Okay. This is the team I'm part of, and this is the number that you can contact me. Okay, so currently now we are offering a free portfolio review service. Okay, so if let's say you want a free portfolio analysis of all the stocks in your portfolio, okay, you can you can come out and open an account under Marine Parade, okay, Marine Parade branch, okay, and then we can actually arrange an appointment so that we can have a free portfolio review. So with that, I would like to pass the time. <laughs>